Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be having the opportunity to chat with you all today. So my name is Martez Mott. I'm a PhD candidate in the Information School at the University of Washington. And I'm going to present some work um, that I conducted over the summer as an intern at Microsoft Research in Redmond. And I'm going to be presenting on behalf of my co-authors, Jane E., Cindy Bennett, Ed Kutro, and Mary Ringo Morris. And our paper is about understanding the accessibility of smartphone photography for people with motor impairments. So personal photography is an important aspect of our lives. And it used to be that due to the cost and time it took to get film developed, personal photography was really limited to really specific and special moments. So people used to capture things like family vacations and weddings and graduations. But now, with the proliferation of smartphones, users now have immediate access to digital cameras, high quality digital cameras, right in their pockets at all times. And so, as a result, personal photography is no longer just limited to capturing these rare and special moments. People now take pictures of, they, now people take self-portraits or selfies. People take pictures of the food they eat every day. And they also take these functional photos, right? So you might take a photo of the receipt. So when you go back home to your university, you could get reimbursed for your food purchases. But as, and also, as these smartphone cameras have improved in performance and ubiquity, um, you also see this explosion right, of all these different apps that support different options of photo capture, sharing, and editing. So some of the most popular applications on smartphones today, like Facebook, Snapchat, Snapchat and Instagram, um, all include these functionalities. So auto smartphone photography has become more mainstream and commonplace in many users' daily lives it still poses significant accessibility challenges to many people with motor impairing conditions like cerebral palsy or Parkinson's disease, and for people who experience motor control issues as a result of age-related age tremor, injury, or other illnesses. So what we wanted to do is that in this effort to understand the accessibility challenges faced by people with motor impairments when engaging in smartphone photography, we conducted a survey and interview study with people with motor impairments. So the first study we conducted was a survey study where we were interested to learn about users' experiences using a smartphone to capture, edit, and share photographs. So in total, we received 91 responses, of which 46 were um, suitable for analysis. So 23 of the respondents were female, 23 were male, and the survey consisted of 41 multiple choice and open-ended questions where we asked users about their experience engaging in smartphone photography and what challenges they experienced and what strategies they employed to overcome those challenges. So after our survey study, we conducted in-person semi-structured interviews with 12 participants with motor impairments. So the interview questions were designed to kind of bring out more themes that we found inside of our survey study. And based on the survey data, oh, pardon me. <laughs> based on the survey data, we also created two design probes of alternative photography methods. So we also, we presented these design probes to people and asked them for their feedback. And I won't have time in this talk to go into great detail about the design probes and other aspects of, uh, par of our participants' photo sharing and editing behaviors. So in this presentation, I'm just gonna focus on the photo capturing challenges and the strategies that people employ to overcome those challenges. So one of the first things we were interested to know was, well, how often do our participants capture photos in the first place? So like right now, how often do they take photographs? So our from our survey respondents, we found that when asked how often do they currently take photographs, 46% responded that they take photographs daily. However, when respondents were asked how often would you like to take photographs, 75% responded that they would like to take photographs daily. So then the question becomes is, what is preventing users with motor impairments from capturing his photos as often as they would like? So from the analysis of our survey and interview data, we found four primary challenges which prevented users with motor impairments from capturing photos more often. These challenges were steadying the phone, framing their shots, zooming, and actuating the shutter. So next, I'm gonna go into further detail and describe these challenges and the strategies people employ to overcome them. Okay, so the first one is steadying the phone. So keeping the phone steady during photo capture was an issue for 75% of our survey and interview participants. And we found that they employed a couple different strategies to overcome this challenge. So the first strategy was to use their body or some other type of stable surface to steady themselves before capturing a shot. Um, so one of our respondents wrote, I have to try to set my hand on something to help minimize the tremor. Sometimes that is my leg, a table, or an armrest. 
And Pete, our, one of our participants also subscribed to a similar approach. I have so much muscle spasticity because of my CP, cerebral palsy, that when I'm not stabilizing the camera with both hands, it will move a little bit. It moves, it gets blurry, my picture's toast. So another strategy participants employed was to capture several photos quickly with the hope that at least one of those photos would come out well. I literally just did the function where you hold the button down and you take a million pictures, so then at least I knew there was going to be a better chance of me getting one that was actually clear. And the last strategy we found was that participants would just ask others to take photos on their behalf. So one of our respondents wrote, if I, if I want to take a picture when my symptoms are prevalent, I just don't do it, or I ask someone else to take the photo for me. And one of our um, other participants described asking others to take photos, especially when they want like, a particularly interesting shot. I'm never going to take a picture like this by myself or with friends just because it never turns out. I just know that. Anything that is like, this is really cool, and I kind of frame it up, and then I'll hand the phone to somebody else, to somebody, and I'm like, can you take it? Because my hands shake. So the next issue we found was actually properly placing objects in the shot. And that was actually a problem for 46% of our participants. And one of the things we found was that involuntary movements that happened right before taking the shot were a big problem. My hand ticks, tremor, affect framing and focus. I sometimes miss shots I want because I have to move my hand instead of lining up a shot. And it's also, um, one of our participants actually described how actuating the shutter will actually cause photos to become poorly framed. I'll have it framed, and then as I'm trying to figure out how to hit that button, I'll jiggle the camera or something, and the photo doesn't turn out the way I wanted it to. Participants also described difficulty expressing or being able to capture or frame certain types of shots. Um, so taking close-up photos is difficult due to the fact that focusing and getting the right frame are things that take an extra hand to set up. Or if I'm holding on to the object in question, I have to press the in-frame hand against the outer case of my phone and manipulate the object to fit the frame rather than manipulate the camera to fit the shot. It's awkward to do, to, it's awkward to do that in a way, to say the least. So the next one is zooming. So zooming the camera's view was a problem for 80% of our participants. And one of the biggest issues was actually keeping the phone steady while zooming. Zooming could be a challenge, both because it requires two finger movement while holding the phone and also keeping the phone steady in high zoom situations. Another issue is actually attempting to zoom may accidentally trigger other types of on-screen smartphone functionalities, including taking multiple unattended photographs. It's difficult to operate the zoom while holding the phone and to keep it from taking multiple shots accidentally, pressing too hard, holding the pressure down for too long. So what we found was actually a common strategy that our participants employed was to first lower their phone to a comfortable position, like a table in their lap, zoom into the screen, then bring the phone back up to get in to capture the shot. Because I don't have the flexibility, I can't really hold it with the left hand and zoom it. So I basically will go like this, lowers the phone, zooms, and then I'll bring it back up. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a really short video of one of our participants actually demonstrating this behavior. So in the video, you'll see she's trying to line up the shot, and she wants to zoom. But in order to bring up the zoom, she has to do this pinch to zoom gesture, which is difficult for her to perform. But as soon as she's able to finally bring up the on-screen slider that comes up after you do the pinch to zoom, she's able to zoom the shot. Then she raises the phone back up, and then is able to take the shot she wants. So the last challenge we found was actually uh, was actuating the shutter, which was a problem for 42% of our participants. And one of the biggest things we found is that just the location of the, the camera button can be problematic for some users. I have to use one hand to hold the phone and my other hand to press the camera button. If the camera button were put in closer to the edge of the screen, I might be able to take photos with one hand and use the other hand for balance, et cetera. And we also found out that phone orientation matters. So depending on the person's abilities, they might have to hold the phones in certain ways, and that can become a problem. So for some people, portrait mode, for example, might be more convenient. I think portrait is probably easier because the button is closer to where your thumb would be versus landscape. It's harder to get that spot you, that you click the button. So we were also interested to know if any of our participants use voice control at any time to try to capture photos. So none of our interview participants reported using voice control, and 14% of our respondents reported using it. 
So this was interesting, though, because however, when we asked participants if they would like to use voice control, it was generally really well received by most of our participants. P2 said, that would be pretty cool just saying, take a photo, boom, done. And other participants brought up that it would be actually nice if you could use voice to do other things other than just actuate the shutter. Yeah, you can imagine if I had both hands on the camera, I could just tell it like zoom five and then whatever else. If it was actually good at doing those things, yeah, that would be sweet. So while um, using voice was actually, you know, well received by some participants, some participants actually um, mentioned that they, they doubted that that functionality would work well for them. So one of the participants said, one of the challenges I have is people tell me they have a hard time understanding me. My voice can get softer if I'm not on fully, so voice recognition, I guess, might have to be very precise or trained for that difference. There are different variations in your voice. I think in Parkinson's, they call it facial paralysis in your voice when you talk. So another thing that we found that arose in our um, interviews with our participants was this idea of missed capture opportunities. So participants described um, situations where they wanted to um, capture a photo but didn't due to some type of external forces. So one of these were inaccessible environments. Uh, so participants described times when wanting to capture a photo was difficult, difficult, um, difficult due to having to traverse an uh, inaccessible environment or being situated in one in the first place. So one of our participants said, there's a lot of um, describing visiting in like a busy tourist location. They said, there's a lot of visitors and things like that. And I'm waiting for what I can balance myself against. Is there a wall that is proximal to the shot I want? Is there a bench that I can sit on? Sometimes I'll see something and want it and I really don't know how I'm going to get it. Social pressure also played a role in preventing from participants from capturing photos when they want it. So P2 described the situation with feeling hurried while standing in a long line to take a photo. We were in San Francisco and I wanted to take a picture of the ticket so I will remember what time we're leaving. I took it really fast because there, because there was a long line. I looked at the ticket and it was blurry. That made me sad. And for P9, it just came down to the fact that it takes a lot of time and effort to be able to capture more photos. It's hard to point them out because you don't always think about it, but I could think of plenty of times when if it was just as easy as whipping out my phone and there it is, then I would have taken tons of photos. But because it's this thing where I have to go and I, have, and I hold it, then I have to steady it, which is difficult for me, and then I have to take it. So what we found from these results is that we highlight some of these accessibility challenges encountered by people with motor impairments. And in general, we found that you know, steadying the phone, framing the shot, zooming the view, and actuating the shutter just requires a lot of time and actual physical effort, which deters our participants from engaging more in smartphone photography. And we also found that these external factors like inaccessible environments or social pressure will also prevent people from capturing as often as they would like. So, you know, to increase the accessibility of smartphone camera applications for users with motor impairments, you know, we really do need to decrease this time and effort that's placed on them. So next I'm going to describe three different design recommendations that can, we can implement now that can help improve the accessibility of current smartphone applications for camera capture. Okay, so the first recommendation is just to make the camera button adjustable by the user. So on many camera apps, the camera button is fixed to the bottom middle location of the screen. And this can be problematic for some users depending on their, how their hands are placed or how they have to hold the phone. And an adjustable camera button will just allow them to place the, the location of the button in a place that's most comfortable and convenient for them. Our second re recommendation is to allow users to zoom with just a single finger. So like you saw in the video, this, um, it can be quite difficult for some people to do this pinch to zoom gesture. It actually requires a lot of dexterity to be able to do it. But if we allow users to just have an on-screen control, something like a single slider, or something like a large button that will allow users to decrease or increase the zoom by certain increments, would actually go a long way in, in decreasing the effort it takes to actually zoom the camera view. And the last recommendation is just to promote and expand voice commands. So on, on Apple iOS, you can ask Siri to take a selfie for you, and in some Google Android applications, so like the Samsung Galaxy series, you can actually use voice commands to take a photo. But none of our participants knew about these features even when it was available to them. So we believe that it's important that we need to promote voice controls. So you could put a voice control icon on the home screen of the camera application right next to the flash and the filter buttons, things like that. And we also need to ex ex promote and I mean, expand these applications to more than just photo capture. So things like zooming, applying filters, and et cetera. 
So I mentioned these design probes that we gave our users. So we also think there's other options that we can do outside of just regular camera applications that, actually, that could actually increase um, smartphone photography for people. So one of the design probes we showed users was this notion of infrastructure camera control. So the idea is that users would be able to remotely access cameras located in an environment. So imagine being at Disney World or some type of public square and being able to just access cameras located in the environment, being able to take a photo from those remote cameras and then having that image saved on your local device. And the next design probe we um, show participants is this idea of pair photography. So a lot of participants mentioned having to um, ask others to take a photo on their behalf, but you lose a little bit of control when that happens. So in our pair photography concept, you will have a director and an operator, and the director instructs the operator on what they want to actually take a photo of. And the view on the direct, the, of the operator's phone is constantly shared with the director, and they can communicate in real time so the director can instruct the operator what photo they want. And then once the operator takes the photo, it's just stored on the director's phone. So in conclusion, I presented some results that describe the different accessibility challenges faced by people with motor impairments when using a smartphone to engage in photography. These challenges of steadying the phone, framing the shot, zooming, and actuating the shutter is preventing people from being able to engage in photography as often as they would like. And we've also presented some design recommendations for improving smartphone accessibility and some design pros which could um, provide some inspiration for future accessible camera applications. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd just like to end a quote from P9, who spoke about the importance of smartphone photography in their life. Um, the photographs are for social media. Social media is for expanding your social network, which is something that people with a disability typically struggle with, the size or sphere of their social network, either because they don't have mobility, they can't get places, or because the activities that they are doing just aren't as widely varied as everybody else. I like to think about it more than just the accessibility of cameras. Thank you. Hello there. Hello. That was a great talk, very eye-opening for me, so thank you for sharing that. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on this uh, pair photography mode. That sounds really interesting. So did participants like the idea? Did they explain what kind of situations they would use it in, especially since definitely I could see some social awkwardness with that, so just curious. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, um, people responded favorably to it overall. So we asked people like, you know, are there situations that you would want to use these in? So a lot of people expressed, you know, wanted to use it with, you know, friends or significant others, kind of the same way they do now. So now they kind of have this thing where it's like, you might give your phone to somebody, or you might ask someone else like, hey, can you take the photo? But then they describe like, if you ask someone else to take a photo, the photo's now on their phone and they forget to send it to you and it's this thing or it's not exactly the, the photo you want. You might say like, hey, can you get my shoes in this photo? Or hey, can you make sure this tree is in the background? And with the pair of photography, you can see in real time the photo that they're trying to take. And then you can instruct them to say like, hey, make sure you frame it this specific way. Um, and we also ask people like, for example, would you be comfortable you know, doing this with strangers? You know, let's say you're at a concert and maybe someone has a different viewpoint than you. you know, would you be okay linking up with a random stranger and you know, um, providing that example? And some people said yes, but most people said no to that. Uh, but yeah, in the paper we have uh, some more details about uh, the different type of feedback we got on, on that probe. Awesome, very cool design idea, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Hi, Ray Zhang from University of Washington. Um, so interesting investigation on the behavior of taking photo, but I think like your design um, maybe applied to broader design, like a UI interface for mortal imp impairments. Like when you're talking about the, the, button, the button size, I think it might be like uh, proper for, for the generalized uh, UI designs, just like uh, uh, giving a, intermediate layer for the in, uh, motor impairments to let them adjust any UI interface. Do you think it's a more like a broadening, broadening problem? Yeah, yes. Um, a lot of the accessibility challenges with photography are going to be prevalent through a lot of different type of um, kind of like uses that a person might engage with a smartphone. So like, you know, we know from prior work that, you know, button locations and button sizes and things like that can be problematic. So in general, I think that a lot of the findings that we have here about, you know, 
making things more adjustable by the user, for example, is something that would help in other different type of applications. It would also help people um, without motor impairments as well. So people that could be situationally impaired, um, for example, if you want to take a photo, you only have one hand available, having to be able to, you know, manipulate the location of the camera button and things like that might be really useful for, in those situations too. Uh, one last question. So you talk about voice control. Yeah. I'm not sure if you like if you have done an experiment like talking to the participant to uh, about the voice con voice control function and to see um, whether they like the idea or not in their daily usage or in the experiment. Course, like even they say they like the voice voice control. It doesn't mean like they will use it frequently or like that. Yeah. I think if you you can do a further investigation about that, yeah, a, yes. yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think there's definitely going to be situation specific, right? So it might be certain times where if you know if you're at your home or you're in a certain situation, it might be okay to use voice, but you might feel socially awkward using voice yeah. in a situation that's like in the library and it's really quiet or something like that. So I definitely think it's going to be you know context specific when people want to use it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this morning and I do encourage you to read all of the papers. They're